Well, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine, Brian Host. Uh, Brian and I served together at uh, Valley Church, um, an evangelical free church here in the metro area for about six, seven years or so. And um, then our paths kind of diverted. And, and now he's um, with Reach Global, which is the mission arm of the Evangelical Free Church of America, of which we are um, a church, a evangelical free church. So um, I'm really super excited to invite my friend Brian Host up to to give our message this morning. Todd's away on a well um, needed uh, vacation and with his family. So um, let's just give a warm Ankeny Free Church welcome to Brian Host. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Yeah, Kevin and I have been friends for a really, really long time. As he mentioned, we were on staff together at Valley Church. and I've been an evangelical free church pastor for 24 years now. It's getting, my kids are getting old. Um, that's how that works. Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, they're getting old, we're not. So that's how, that's how it plays out. Um, it used to be that we, our congreg my congregation was just folks like you in, you know, in Polk City or in, in West Des Moines. And these days, that's still the case in many, many ways, but our, mine and my wife's congregation now are pastors and leaders in churches in, throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East, Latin America, um, Southeast Asia. We train pastors and leaders, uh, folks who may not have the opportunity to receive some of the training and blessings that, that we can have here. Our job is to develop these leaders so that they can reach their own countries and communities for the gospel. Um, we're not traveling overseas right now for obvious reasons, but thankfully with things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and, and WhatsApp and stuff like that, we're, we're busier than ever. We're just not in person with people. Um, and then also we're kind of doing something new, our, our team. There's lots of folks from the countries that we work in and minister in who have come here. The Lord has brought them here. And so we're working in, in Des Moines and, and other cities across the 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 United States, we're beginning to develop some training partnerships with migrant church leaders who, who live in our own communities. So when, um, when life gives you lemons, what do you do? You make lemonade, right? So we're, like everyone else, we're trying to adjust our ministry to be as effective as possible for the gospel. So, so thanks for welcoming uh, me today. Uh, my wife will be at the next service, so sorry that she wasn't here to see you today. But I want to tell you a story as we get going here today. I wanted to tell you a story about a guy named John Sumner, this English guy. We see it, we'll have a couple pictures of John uh, up on the screen. And John's friend, John made a, a, an unlikely friendship with a seagull named Chirpy. Uh, that's what he named him, Chirpy. Uh, they met about 12 years ago, and, and the first day that they met, Chirpy was, was hovering over John's head in extreme agony. This bird had severely broken his leg, and it was visibly just horrifyingly broken, and the bird was just screaming in pain, and um, John's like, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, it's, it was disturbed him a lot to see this bird um, screaming and shouting over his head, and so the next day, John came back, and the same thing. This bird's in a lot of pain, a lot of agony, and so John just, he had his dog, Jack, with him, so John took some dog biscuits that he had, you know, reserved for his dog Jack and just started feeding this seagull named Chirpy. And that, this happened day after day after day. And I'm not sure what was in the, you know, the dog biscuits, but eventually the bird recovered. Uh, he, his leg was still a little funny looking, but he recovered. The bird is doing fine now. And so uh, the bird will go away for like the mating nesting season and he'll come back and every time he comes back, John will go to the beach every day during that season and Chirpy comes back to him and he hovers around him and he knows who John is. Um, Chirpy will try to get some of his little seagull friends to come by John. They never do, but Chirpy comes back day after day after day. And John Sumner, this 80-year-old British guy, he's like, it's the weirdest thing. It's like this bird has some some sort of relationship with me. I can't explain it. He tells his friends about it, and they're just, <clears throat> he says, people are aghast. Right? That's a good British word, right? People are aghast when I tell them, and they just can't believe that the seagull would come back to me over and over and over again. So little Chirpy, you know, all's well that ends well with little Chirpy. He recovered from dog biscuits. So I don't know, man, maybe next time if you break a bone, try dog biscuits. I'm just saying it worked for Chirpy. It might work for you. And so as I was 
coming across this story. And by the way, if where I got this story and the next one that I'll show a little bit later in the message, there's an app called the Good News Network. The Good News Network. It's not a Christian app, but they have really uh, positive stories. So if you get a little run down by the negativity in the media, uh, I, I have an iPhone, but probably Android, the Good News Network. It, it's really, really interesting creative stories. And if you're a pastor, it's just awesome sermon illustrations, right? So this story, you know, I was thinking, why does this story resonate with us, this Chirpy and John Sumner story? Why does it stick out in our minds as unusual or special or unique? And I think there's two reasons. Number one, I think the most obvious reason is because wildlife typically doesn't respond to human beings like, like Chirpy did to John. Um, and we know that we live in a fallen world, and at one point in the beginning, Adam and Eve and the animals were, were, you know, got along real well and everything was great, but it's not like that anymore. And when something like, like this happens, it stands out. The less obvious reason, I think, is that this story gives us a glimpse. It gives us a glimpse of what things would be like if we were at peace with the creation in which we live and also at peace with the Creator who made us. So it just gives us a little glimpse of like, this is how it used to be and this is how it will be at some point in time. And I think Mr. Sumner's unusually deep an intimate relationship with this bird, Chirpy, I think it, I think it um, stimulates in us a longing for what should have been in our relationship with the world around us, the people around us, but more importantly, our relationship with God. Uh, John said of, of Chirpy, he has some sort of relationship with me. I, I can't explain it. And it's like this, this guy, John Sumner, who maybe not like, he's not the horse whisperer or the dog whisperer, but he's the seagull whisperer. It's like this guy is echoing the heart of God back to us in this story. He's echoing the heart of a God who tells us in the pages of Scripture that, that you have some sort of relationship with Him. Uh, and sometimes we, we can, can grasp that, and a lot of times we're not quite sure exa exactly what this is, but but we have some sort of relationship with God, as unlikely as it may seem to some people in our world. And so this morning, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34, we're going to go through verses 8 through 17. And in this passage, God will tell you some very specific things about this some sort of relationship. Uh, and this is a relationship that He greatly desires to have with you. But what exactly is it? I mean, John was sort of vague in this relationship with the seagull. I don't think he understood it himself. He just said it's some sort of relationship. Well, what sort of relationship does God want to have with you? And as you're going to see on the screen here, I, I, I think this is the, maybe one of, the, one of the good ways to sum, summarize this, uh, this passage is that God is longing he desires, he goes out of his way uh, to have a covenant relationship with you, a covenant relationship with you. It's not just a, a relationship. In, in some ways, relationships could be a dime, a dozen, even just somebody that you met at hy V and you talked to about, you know, beans. That could be some sort of relationship, uh, but this is something different. This is a covenant relationship, and I think the word covenant makes all the difference in the world. I think the word covenant is really a game changer here. And so, I think it might be good to ask, so what is a covenant relationship? If, if we're going to explore this relationship that God wants to have with us and, and unpack it, maybe we should be asking, what is a covenant relationship? Or, better yet, maybe we start with, what is a covenant? What is a covenant? A lot of times when we think of covenant, we think of a contract, but a covenant isn't a contract. A contract is an agreement that two parties make, and if one party breaks the agreement, then it's over, or there's problems, there's trouble. Covenants are, are different. Generally speaking, a covenant is a chosen relationship or a partnership in which two parties make a binding and unbreakable promise to one another. And it's within this promise, it's within this bond that they work together to reach a common goal. Covenants contain defined obligations and they contain defined commitments, but they differ from a contract because covenants are relational, they're personal, they're guarded, and that's what we're going to see this morning. 
I think perhaps the best way for us to look at, at, um, at the concept of a covenant in our human condition is the covenant of marriage. I was, I t- was talking to somebody earlier today. I was at a wedding in Sheldahl, Iowa yesterday, outside in the park. It was beautiful. Uh, this two, two people, this young couple, they made a covenant with one another to I- exist in an exclusive uh, bond of marriage for the rest of their lives. And so in, in love, a husband and a wife choose to enter into a formal covenant relationship, binding themselves to one another in a lifelong uh, relationship of faithfulness and, de- and devotion, and they work as partners together to reach all sorts of common goals. That's probably the strongest way for us to illustrate um, God's covenant with us is via the covenant of marriage. Now, the covenant relationship that God longs to have with you is also very special. In this relationship, the Lord promises us several things. And so when you're reading your Bible, here's a little um, free tip for you. Um, When you're reading your Bible, God uses all different kinds of names for himself to describe various aspects of his character, various aspects of, of who he is, his nature, how he relates to us. So he'll use lots of different names. And a little bit later today, we're going to talk about a, a, a name that God uses for himself that may seem a bit surprising at first, but when you see the word Lord in the Bible, when God calls himself Lord, in Hebrew, that's the name Yahweh. And that is the most sacred name that God has for himself. He only uses it when he talks about um, how he exerts his passionate love for you and I in the, in the bonds of the covenant that he wants to make with us. So right now, as we're getting into this passage, we can see a little cue in the text that because he uses the name Lord, Yahweh, this is serious covenant business that he's talking about. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe not, but it will in a minute. So, to give you uh, just a small sampling of what it means in God's heart and mind for us to be in covenant, um, I want to talk about some of the promises that He makes to us in the covenant. Number one, God promises to give you the right to all the blessings that He has to offer, like all, all of them. That's His promise to you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And I remember the, the first time I read Ephesians chapter 1, And there's a part in Ephesians chapter 1 where it says, you know, we were all born uh, in sin, and we were all born um, spiritually unable to commune with God. It was like God was broadcasting, but our receiver was so damaged that we couldn't even receive anything from God. And a little bit later in Ephesians 1, God says, you were by nature objects of wrath. Like, you were a dumpster in which God was going to pour all of his wrath into because of our inherent rebellion against him. And the tone changes very quickly in this passage, but in the midst of this covenant, God says, you're not an object of wrath. I give you the right, which is crazy. I give you the right to receive all the blessings that I have to offer to you. I'm holding nothing back. He promises to give you a new heart you've read that before, a heart that no longer desires to practice sin. God promises to forgive you of all of your wrongdoing, all of your sins, so that you can dwell with Him for all of eternity in the sinless, corruption-free paradise of heaven, a place that Paul describes as, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can even conceive what this is going to be like. God promises to pour out His Spirit in you so that you will want to love Him, you will want to obey Him. God promises to allow you to live in such a way that you will be able to practice righteousness and justice. It'll be like your your mother tongue, so that you can reflect His light to the people that live around you. God promises to be your God and to claim you as His treasured possession. I ran across another story on the Good News Network. I don't have any photos, but they, they did a sampling of children all around the world of what was in their pockets, what were their most treasured possessions. And if you ever get on that app, just search that. It was really cute to see what kids all around the world kept in their pockets as their most treasured possession, and they guarded it, uh, sacredly guarded this stuff. A lot of commonalities, but some different things depending upon where they lived. You're God's most treasured possession. Now, as you can see on the screen, we, we're talking about the fact that God is longing to have a covenant relationship with you. It's not something that he's begrudgingly entering into, or it's like, well, yeah, I guess I made them, and so I guess I got to do something with them. He wants this. He's longing for this. 
And so we're going to learn more about this in Exodus 34, 8 through 17. But first, I think we need to do a little background to bring us up to speed. Uh, you, if you've been following this series in, in Exodus, you remember Exodus 32. That's like a low point for the people of Israel. In Exodus 32, it was kind of the, the golden calf like fiasco, right? Uh, God delivers these people in such unimaginably amazing ways from the uh, slavery in Egypt, and He parts the Red Sea in this incredible stuff that God has done for them. They get to this mountain. Moses goes up to receive the law. He's gone a little bit longer than they think he should be gone. So what do they do? Um, Aaron describes it as, this is one of the craziest things in the Bible. He's like, you know what, Moses? We just threw this gold into the fire and out sprang this golden calf. So we just started worshiping it. They worship this, one of the gods of Egypt, this golden calf, and God is not happy. And so he's going to take care of of business here, and Moses approaches God to intercede for the people. He's like, Lord, don't, please don't wipe these people out. I know they're crazy, but they're my crazy, and so please don't do it. So God, uh, he doesn't wipe them out, but he does send a plague that kills many of the people of Israel. And in Exodus 33, we learn that God tells the people, okay, you all need to move out. Go to the promised land. I'm not going with you. If I go with you, I'm probably going to wipe you out along the way because you're rebellious and, and you're crazy. So I, I'm, I'm not going. And I don't know, like parents or grandparents, was there ever a time um, when your kids were little and they or maybe not so little, and they did something that made you so mad, you were just like, I remember my parents said to Misty once, you need to go out of my presence for a little while because I don't want to say or do something that I'm going to regret. That was where God was with these people. So Moses has this heart-to-heart kind of talk with God in in Exodus 33, and then the, the Lord agrees to lead them to the promised land, and he agrees to show Moses his glory. So that brings us to Exodus 34, the verses 1 through 7, just before what we're going to talk about today. God tells Moses to replace the stone tablets that the Ten Commandments were, were written on, and the Lord visits Moses in a very unique and a very special way uh, with his presence. And we know that God has to totally dial back his awesomeness because it would just incinerate Moses. But he visits Moses in a certain way. Uh, Moses has just experienced the presence of God And now we get to our passage this morning, Exodus 34, uh, verses 8 through 17. But I'm just going to read verses 8 through 10 for right now, so follow along with me. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. This was after he had seen God's glory. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, and this is key, I am making a covenant with you. I'm making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before seen in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. God is longing to have a covenant relationship with you, just like he was with the people of Israel. In essence, he was saying, and I'd like you to look at this word cloud picture coming up, he's saying, um, I am the doctor who heals you. I am your guardian, and you are my most treasured possession. I am the father who protects you. I am the mother who nurtures you. There's a name for God that he uses of himself in the Old Testament, and it's called El Shaddai. And what that means in Hebrew is God of the two breasts. It speaks of of God's nurturing love for his people, the love that a mother has for her her newborn baby. It's, It's just fascinating. God is the mighty warrior father who protects you, but he's also the mother who nurtures you. I am your king and you are my people, he says. I am your loving husband and you are my bride. In the midst of this covenant, God says, I am your shepherd who protects you from your enemies. And God says this in the midst of this, tied up in this this sentence that says, I am making a covenant with you. What God is saying is, I will make an eternal bond with you. Even though you will persistently reject me, I will continue to nurture this bond. 
And when you break this covenant, and, and you will break it, I will pay the price for any covenant failure on your part. If it was a contract, the breaking of the covenant would cause um, uh, damage to the one who broke it. But God says, you know what? This is a covenant, not a contract. When you break it, when you transgress it, instead of you paying the price for it, I'll pay for it. When you sever the bonds of our love, the Lord says, I will draw you back with cords of loving kindness. And so, as I'm hearing these words coming out of my mouth, every time I hear it, every time I say it, I just think, why would God do this? Like, if it was me, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't have this uh, capacity, obviously, that God has, and most of us don't, but why would God do this, offer these, these bonds that in the face of rejection after rejection, why would he continue to do this? Well, he tells us why he does this in verse 10. He says, I'm, I'm making this covenant with you. I'm continuing to draw you back every time you try to run away because I want the people you live among to see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that God does what God does in this world so that the people of this world might see His glory. God exists to radiate His glory, just like the sun in our solar system exists to radiate its light and heat, and that's what gives us the ability to have life on this planet. God exists to radiate His glory. Now, I know that we see this phrase a lot in the Bible, this, this phrase, God's glory, the glory of the Lord, God's glory, all of these kind of phrases, and on one level, I think we know what it means, because we know, you know, English, but on another level, I, I'm not so sure we fully understand what this means. What does it mean, this phrase, God's glory? Well, it means a lot of things, and there could be a, a, a year-long sermon series on just that, but maybe one way to say it is God's glory is everything that makes God, God. Because there is no greater being in the universe than God, the best thing that God can do to you and for you is display His glory, display His greatness, display, display his, his Godness, if you want to say it that way, to you. And thankfully, among the many ways that God does this, God wants to reveal His Godness, His grace, His mercy, His power, His protection, all of these things by showing you His limitless kindness in the midst of of this covenant relationship. So maybe the next question I want to ask, or I want to maybe ask for us and, and answer through this passage is, why is this relationship so important to God? We've talked about the fact that God wants this relationship with you. Uh, we've identified this, that this relationship is a covenant relationship, and that's very, very different than a lot of things we're used to. But why is this relationship so important to God? Well, it's important to God because you are His treasured possession, and He is very protective of you. It's, it's like God has you in His pocket, and He's going to keep you there to keep you safe and to protect you because you're important to Him. You're the only being, uh, type of being in this universe in, in which God has breathed His breath of life into, and you're the only creature in this universe that God... Um, has created in his own image. You're his magnum opus. He loves you. You are his treasured possession. That's why the relationship is so important. Verse 11 says, uh, it continues after God says, I'm going to make this covenant with you, but there's something that needs to happen on the other end of the covenant, on our end. God says, obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, all of these people living in the land that I'm going to give you, I'm going to drive them out. And you need to do something in verse 12. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you're going, or they will be a snare to you. Now, what's a snare? A snare is something that's used to trap an animal, right? Uh, they'll, you'll be trapped. If you, make, if you make treaties with these people, it's going to be your downfall. What I want you to do, he says in verse 13, is break down their altars 
smashed their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles. These were all things that were used in the most horrendous and bizarre and sickening forms of worship. Smashed those down. And then this little part of the message here, verse 14, it's all important, but verse 14 is particularly important. He says, do not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous, capital J, is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. In fact, he says that that's one of his names. Uh, he actually calls one of his names in the Bible jealous. And that's probably not a word that we would associate with God. If someone, if someone said, hey, give me some characteristics and attributes and names of God, we would talk about his love, his power, his grace, his majesty, his glory, his kindness, but probably not jealousy. And probably because in the human condition, jealousy often plays out in, in pretty negative ways. Um, we can reflect the, the sunny side of jealousy, which is the name of this message, uh, but so, most of the time we reflect the, the dark side of jealousy in our relationships. I mean, the music that I grew up to listening when I was a teenager, if it wasn't for the ugly side of jealousy, there, half of those songs wouldn't exist, right? There it is, one chuckle, thank you. Uh, J.R. Packer is a theologian who is just super sharp. This is what he says about God's jealousy. God's jealousy is not a compound of frustration, envy, and spite, as human jealousy so often is, but it appears instead as a praiseworthy zeal to preserve something that is supremely precious. It appears instead as a praiseworthy zeal to preserve something that is supremely precious. Let's take a look at another unlikely display of maybe the darker side of jealousy. We'll see it on the screen here in a second. I got jealous of the bird and a jealous dog. No, right here. That's okay, you're my favorite. It goes on for a little bit. We can, we can stop it there. So I also found this on the Good News Network. I, I don't work for them or anything, but if you're looking for interesting stories. So this guy, this guy lives in Los Angeles. He's a movie producer. Have you ever heard of like when the president pardons a turkey at Thanksgiving? And somehow he, I don't know how, I don't know why, but he got this turkey in one of those deals. I don't know even how. It doesn't even matter. But this turkey is super affectionate, and the turkey hugs him all the time. Like, the turkey's hugging him. He didn't rub, like, I don't know, if it was a dog, it would be bacon grease. I don't know what turkeys eat. It's not like he rubbed turkey food on him. This turkey loves him. But the problem is, is that this guy has had a German shepherd for many, many, many years, who was not loving the fact that the turkey was stealing his daddy away from him. And so you saw the German shepherd come up, and the turkey and the dog kind of got into it for a split second. Did you notice that? That the dog and the turkey weren't loving the fact? They were jealous. It was, uh, like jealousy always has like a root of goodness, but it just comes out in, in ugly ways a lot of times in our life, in our lives, and, and in the lives of turkeys and jealousy is different. God, if we have any moms out here on earth to protect, that's God's love for us, this passionate, protective love. It's the kind of love that Jesus describes as leaving the 99 sheep behind to go after the one that has wandered away. It's that kind of love. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that God guards more assertively than his love for us. Nothing. So we've talked about the fact, and it'll flash up on the screen here, we've talked about a few things this morning. We've talked about the fact that, that God is longing to have a covenant relationship with you. We've discussed what is a covenant relationship, because it's a little different than many that we're used to. We've gained some insight into the, the question of why is this relationship so important to God? It's because uh, you're a treasured possession of His, and He wants to guard you with everything He has, which quite frankly is a lot. But I think there's one last bit that we need to look into this morning. One last bit. And, and the question is this, you know, we understand how God feels about us and, and what this relationship is like in His mind, but is this related to the word covenant, don't we? We need to go back to the word covenant. Um, a covenant relationship, and I have another little word cloud thing for you to look at. A covenant relationship is a mutual relationship 
uh, it's not just exclusive, it's mutual. There's two sides. If God is your doctor, then you are his patient. If God is your father, then you're his child. If God is your king, then you're his subject. If God is your shepherd, then you're his lamb. There's a part that we have to play, a role that we get to play in this covenant relationship. Now, God knew that we, along with the ancient Israelites and along with everyone else that's lived on this planet, uh, He knew that we would struggle with this concept. We would struggle with the idea that if God was going to be our God, then we would need to turn away from every other God, every other idol, every other whatever that takes us away from God that exists in our lives. And we were to do this so that we would remain in this exclusive relationship with Him. It's just like a marriage. It's just like a marriage. It's exclusive, but it's mutual between the two partners. And that's why he he said in in Exodus 34, 11, I mean, I've already read this a little bit, but I'm going to reread some things here, and then we're going to move on. But in verse 11, he's like, you need to obey what I've commanded you today. He's like, I'm going to drive all of these people out, these people that are really doing some things that are pretty horrendous, but I, I need you to be careful not to make a treaty with them, because if you do, it's going to be a trap for you. You need to break down the altars. You need to smash the stones, cut down the poles. All of these, these um, things that they use to worship uh, their false gods, you need to just get rid of them. And then you remember he said, don't worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. He's saying, you have to know how I feel about you. You are so important to me that I, I can't even risk the thought of you going off the deep end here. And then he says in verse 15, he says, be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. For when, not if, when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. And then he ends in verse 17 by saying, do not make any idols just avoid it. Now, in the time and place of the writing of this passage, which scholars call the ancient Near East, right, ancient Israel, uh, in the time of the writing of this, making a treaty with a group of people meant some pretty important things uh, that maybe are a little bit lost on us today, but making a treaty with a group of people, a foreign nation, meant uh, making a covenant with their gods, Back in those days, you know, the polytheistic many gods, if you made a treaty with this nation, you just bring their group of gods into the one that you already have, and and that was how it was done. It meant making a treaty meant worshiping their gods as legitimate spiritual options on par with the gods that you already had. Obviously, the God of the Bible has a problem with that because he says, I will not share my glory with idols. If you, uh, you know, God is saying, if you make a treaty with the pagan nations, they're going to be a snare to you, so just don't do it. Avoid making treaties. Now, to 21st century ears, this may seem a little unneighborly, right? So this church exists in a community, and and we're called to be salt and light, and one of the things that we want to do here, and in wherever church your church is, if you're listening to this online, uh, we're to be salt and light, we're to be good neighbors, we're to get into the lives of the people who are in, you know, the communities that, that we are called to be salt and light in, and so this seems a little not like that, right? This seems a little bit like, well, why would God say this? It seems a little harsh, a little mean, a little unneighborly, uh, whatever. Well, the reason why God says this is because there is always, always a progression to sinful compromise, always. And in, and in Israel's case, it started with uh, a seemingly benign treaty of mutual advantage with a pagan nation. What, what's the harm in that? You know, it, it, it's just about this well or about, about who gets to draw water out of this river. It's, it's not that big a deal. But then it progresses a little bit. Now um, we're getting together to kind of seal the deal over dinner, but now dinner is eating food sacrificed to a pagan god or goddess. And then it goes a little bit further. It's like the frog in the kettle that doesn't know he's getting boiled. Pretty soon uh, it's an invitation to share in the worship of their gods, which always included sexual immorality, and it often included child sacrifice, some of the most disgustingly horrendous practices. And then it ended up with uh, intermarriage with pagan people, which included adopting their foreign gods and their idols. 
Now, with Israel, it always began as a friendly agreement, and it always ended with God's people stepping out of their covenant relationship with him, always. It was like the golden calf. Do you remember that movie Groundhog Day, like years ago with Bill Murray, every day, over and over? Every day, over and over. Golden calf, 2.0, 3.0, over and over and over again. And what we know is that nothing caused more problems for the people of Israel than the worship of other gods, like nothing. This was their Achilles heel. Eventually, things got so bad that God had to remove them from the promised land. And as we read the pages of the Old Testament, what we maybe come to over and over again is, man, with Israel, if they had only been as jealous for God as he was jealous for them. And it's easy for us to go down that road. I know it's easy for me. Man, if Adam and Eve wouldn't have would have, wouldn't have done that. I, if I was there, I, I wouldn't have done that. If, if I was in ancient Israel, I wouldn't have done that, and, and maybe not with ancient Israel, but a lot of times it's real easy for us to, man, they just, all the time, it's just so obvious from a 30,000-foot view of reading the Scripture so many years later, we can see what they shouldn't have done, but the question is, what about me? What about you? Uh, God is longing to have this covenant relationship with you, and the question that we need to answer, uh, the question that you need to answer this morning as, as well is, is this relationship really all that important to you? I mean, that's something that you have to decide, like daily. Choose this day whom you will follow, but for as me, for me and my house, I, I'll serve the Lord, is what we learn in Scripture. God will move heaven and earth to show his love for you. We, we've, we've established that already in this message. You already know this to be true from your past study of Scripture, and you know it to be true in your personal lives and in the lives of others. God will move heaven and earth to show his love for you, that mama bear love. And I love Deuteronomy chapter 4, 24. It says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. Every time I read that, it repeats in the New Testament as well. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. He will go to great lengths to draw you back into the covenant. If you walk away from his love and his faithfulness, he will pull you back. And he expects, and he actually requires in this covenant relationship, a fiery and faithful love in return. In other words, God wants you to be as jealous for him as he is for you. The hang up for all of us is that we struggle with the same progression of sinful compromise that, that ancient Israel struggled with so long ago. For us, it starts with a seemingly benign treaty of mutual advantage, not with a pagan nation, but with a thought, with a desire, with a person, with an action, with some form of forbidden fruit. And, and for us, it starts with maybe just one glance, just one text, just one click, just one outburst, just one more drink, just one more dollar uh, either worked for in workaholism or, or, or spent in, in that variety of addiction. It's always just one more, isn't it? It's just one more. It was the uh, Rockefeller, one of the guys helped me. I couldn't remember if it was Rockefeller or Carnegie. It was Rockefeller, super rich. He was a billionaire in the age where th there weren't any billionaires. And he was asked, you know, how much, is, how much money is enough? And he said, just one more, just one more dollar. It's never enough, right? It's never enough, one more. And so the progression continues, these one mores in our life. Then we, we rationalize the just one more, whatever it is for, for us, until we get comfortable with it. It's like a pair of shoes that we've broken in or a really comfortable pair of jeans. We just get comfortable with these one more, one more. And then it moves a little further, like it did with ancient Israel. Then we accept the invitation to share in the worship of this thing that is now part of our lives. And then one day, we find that we are bonded. We find that we are, are married to, uh, we're in covenant to this unholy thing, and it becomes for us an idol or a God. And, you know, we can read Exodus 32 and be like, I would, I'm not going to make a golden calf and put it in my living room and worship it. I don't, you know, sacrifice chickens to a, an altar in my backyard, so I'm fine. But, but we're not fine. We make treaties with many, many different things in our lives that lead us down the same path. 
And eventually what this consummates in is maybe not, not marrying pagan people and, and adopting their gods, but what it culminates in is we will, at the end of this progression, will clear away the Lord this God who has made a covenant relationship with us, we clear him off of that, that top shelf in our lives, and we put this false thing in its place. And we all do it. We all do it. Does this progression sound familiar? I mean, it should, because like I just said, we all, we all do it. And so the question, I guess, is, is there a way out of this progression? Is there a way out of this Groundhog Day, this, this cycling, recycling syndrome that we find ourselves in? And the answer from the pages of the Bible is yes, there is a way out. If you have strayed away from God, He lives to welcome you back into this beautiful covenant relationship that we've been talking about here this morning. That is always his heart. And I remember, you know, just over the years of ministries, talking to guys, and they're like, and some gals, Pastor Brian, I I can't come back to the Lord. You don't know what I've done. I mean, it would curl your hair if you knew what I've done. And I said, it doesn't matter what you've done. God will always welcome you back. His mercies are new every morning. He has this capacity that we don't have. And that's part of his jealous love. But it starts with, well, let me say what it doesn't start with first, I guess. It doesn't start with behavior management. That's our deal, right? I'm going to manage my behavior. I'm going to try to control my, my actions. And it lasts for 10 minutes. And we seem to fall back into the same pattern. And then we get disgusted and we're like, I'm going to manage my behavior. And it's round and round and round we go. Where it stops, no, nobody knows. Behavior management isn't the key. The key to breaking out of the cycle and coming back home to God starts with changing your heart. This is the key to coming back home to God. And I want to talk about, as I end here this morning, three steps to the process of what does it mean to to have true and lasting heart change in your life. The first thing that needs to happen is we need to receive God's jealous, passionate, protective love. And I remember in my Christian life early on when I first started hearing that kind of language, I'm like, this is a little psycho babbly. Is that a word, babbly? It is now, right? This is a little psycho babbly, you know, receiving God's love and just whatever. And, you know, if you're listening today and you, you kind of, this, that's a little foofy for me. I, I don't know about that. I, I want to challenge you um, with, with Psalm 91 because Psalm 91 just talks about how we need, like we need oxygen and air and water, we need this love that God offers. Let me read Psalm 91, 1 through 4 to you. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So catalog that word rest in your mind. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Catalog refuge and fortress. Catalog this word trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. We were designed by God to receive this love. I had a friend of mine years ago, he had a Volkswagen Rabbit. Do you remember the Volkswagen Rabbit? It was a diesel. And we were out, Julie and I, my wife and I were out with... with, uh, Roger and Alice, and he knew better, but he was almost out of fuel, and so he went to the gas station, and he's like, I know this isn't going to be good. He put gasoline in his diesel car, and it it didn't go well, right? It did not go well. Let's just put it that way. The car was not designed to, to run on gasoline. It was designed to run on diesel, but that was the only thing that was there, so he used it. We were designed to receive this love of God in the context of the covenant with him. We were designed to be covered by his feathers, metaphorically. We were designed to find our our refuge and our fortress in him. We were designed to dwell in the shelter of the Most High. The Lord is our place of refuge. He is our protector, capital P, from the perils that exist outside of his covenant relationship with God. And I need to tell you this, with all of the sincerity and authenticity that I can, you know, muster you will never find the love and the acceptance that your heart is truly longing for outside of God's jealous love for you. You won't find it. And some of us have spent a lifetime searching for it in so many ways. What's the old song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. You're never gonna find it. 
every substitute will leave you more and more empty, more and more discouraged. So the first is to receive that love of God. The second is, is to pray within the promises of God. The way our hearts are changed is when we pray God's thoughts after Him. So many times we think of prayer as, um, I'm going, to, God, bless my deal, bless my program, bless my agenda, just infuse your supernatural power and your fire so that I can just go out and do what I want to do. But in reality, prayer is just the opposite. Rather than trying to get God to bend the stream of His will into our river, prayer is bending the stream of our will into God's river, to change our heart and our thoughts. And so the best way to change your heart is to pray God's thoughts from the pages of His Word back to Him. This was something that was recommended to me by a mentor when I was in seminary years and years ago, and it's one of the best spiritual disciplines that I've ever incorporated into my life because we know biblically the Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, will work wonders in your life when you do this because He always responds to the words and promises that He has inspired in the pages of His Word. This is the antidote, quite frankly, and quite bluntly. This is the antidote to lifeless, distracted, powerless prayers. If you have uh, experienced times of lifeless, distracted, weak, anemic, powerless prayers, then, then you pray in the wrong prayers. You need to pray the thoughts of God back to Him. So there's a guy named Ken Boa, like boa constrictor, Ken Boa, and he's written several books called Face to Face, and in it, he doesn't change the Scripture, but he rewords the Scripture into prayers, and I encourage you to get these, these books. They're called Face to Face, Ken Boa, and it'll teach you, if you've not had this as a practice in your life, it'll teach you how to pray through the Scripture, how to pray the thoughts of God back to Him. And then pretty soon, after a little time, you're going to be like, well, I can do this. I don't need Ken's books. No offense, Ken. But I can just now pray the Scripture when I'm reading the Bible. If you want to focus your prayer time for meaningful and lasting heart change, then praying through the Bible is not a suggestion. It's a must. It's a must. We need to receive God's love for heart change. We need to um, pray God's thoughts back to Him, and only then will we be able to guard our hearts. And that's the last thing. If we're looking for heart change, we need to guard our hearts. I love, love Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do, everything you are flows from it. And so, let me ask you a few questions here. These are some questions I've been grappling with this week as I've been putting this message together and studying and praying and communing with the Lord. What have you been falling in love with lately? You know, I've read a lot of articles how this COVID era, especially earlier on, the stress and the discombobulation, medicate ourselves with different things when we're off kilter. What have you been falling in love with? What false love has captured your heart? What are you teaching your children to love? Or maybe your, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, whatever. We're, we're teaching the people around us to love something. Is it comfort? Comfort above all, uh, above all else? Is it success? Is it money? Is it work? Is it a game or a hobby? Is it a vice? What are, what are we teaching the people around us to love? What God wants us to do is guard our heart. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is metaphorically just cast out everything in your life that's pulling you away from God. Smash the altars in your life or tear down the altars. Smash the sacred stones. Cut down the Asherah poles. I know you don't have an Asherah pole in your backyard, but just metaphorically, right? Figuratively. Cast all these things out. So visualize your most prized, treasured possession in your life. Just visualize that right now. I don't know that this is my most prized possession, but I'm going to tell you a little confession here. I'm going to make a confession. And some of you men may relate to this, and some of you wives may laugh because it's like, yep, that's his deal. So my father-in-law was like this too, but I'm like this. So I, I drive a Mazda. It's newer, but it's just a Mazda. It's not like a you know Mercedes or whatever. But I am obsessively, compulsively 
like anti-door-ding kind of guy. Can I get an amen from any of the guys here? Or maybe some of the women too. You're like, I, no one likes door-dings. No one loves a door-ding, but it's a thing for me. And so I will park in the back 40 of all back 40s everywhere we go, including this morning. I got like the furthest. I get closest to the edge. I'm like, well, then only, maybe only a door ding on one side. And I try to get over as far as I can. And sometimes you can barely get out of the car. And I remember one time I was at Walmart and I parked in the, the outer reaches of the galaxy. And I come out and there's guys that are like, okay, I know what he's doing, and they're ornery. I come out, this monster truck is parked centimeters from my car. And I'm like, <laughs> I was so mad. I, my wife was, I was so mad. And I was not very Christian in what I was thinking. And I'm just obsessed about door dings. And so visualize what, what your most treasured possession on earth is, and then guard your heart like you would guard that. And so for me, I just think, man, if I can guard my heart half as well as I try to guard against door dings, it's going to be a good thing. Stop making agreements and compromises with sin. Stop making agreements and compromises and treaties with the the idols and the false gods in your life. And, And you know what they are at this point in life. Let me end with this. God, and this is going to be kind of corny, kind of like a Hallmark card cover, but I'm just going to say it anyway. God wants you to fall so in love with him that you are unwilling to have any other lovers, any other idols, any other gods in your life. And folks, that's what it means to be in a covenant relationship with with the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, this is the day that you've made. We rejoice. We're glad in it. We're so thankful that you've given us life and breath and, and the ability to love you and serve you today. This covenant that you desire with us, it's beautiful, it's glorious, but it is really hard, as you know, it's really hard for us to, um, to exist in this covenant because we wander. We're so prone to wander, yet you love us. You draw us back with cords of loving kindness. You tell us that in Hosea. Would you help us, Lord? Be the covenant people that you desire us to be. Would you help us to uh, learn to guard our hearts and to love uh, that which is most lovely, uh, which is you? And would you help us to teach others in our lives to do the same? We ask this, Lord, for, first of all, just for the sake of your name. We ask it for the blessing of your people, and we ask it so that we would be salt and light in this, the places where you've put us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Amen.